Welcome back to Domain 5 of the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And here in Section 5.5, we're going to have a look at audits and assessments. We're going to start with some foundational information. Specifically, we'll dig into the difference between an audit and an assessment before we then look at attestation in the context of audit. We'll explore the elements of internal versus external audit and assessment before we unpack various characteristics of penetration tests. From types of penetration tests to categories of penetration tests, we'll even juxtapose active and passive reconnaissance. All important information and oversight of your security compliance efforts. Let's dig in. Welcome back to Domain 5 of the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And here in Section 5.5, our focus will be audits and assessments. And more specifically, the syllabus challenges us to explain the types and purposes of audits and assessments. We'll explore the concept of attestation. We'll look at internal audit and assessment versus external audit and assessment. We will explore the types and categories of penetration testing and their purpose. We're really not just talking about the what here in terms of audit and assessment, but the why we would use each. But before we do any of that, I need to quickly lay some foundation for you here and answer, what exactly is the difference between a security audit and a security assessment? Allow me to explain, and I'll give you a nice side-by-side -side visual here so you can digest these quickly. In terms of focus, a security audit is focused on compliance with standards or regulations. A security assessment is identifying and prioritizing risks. One is measuring your compliance on the audit side. The other is assessing if there are any risks of non-compliance. The purpose here, from an audit perspective, is verification. Is the organization compliant, yes or no? An assessment is evaluating and analyzing the organization to see if there are risks, if there are gaps. The security audit is generally a formal exercise, often by external auditors. Certainly we can have an internal audit, which is also formal. The level of formality with a security assessment will vary, and the more formal it is, the more likely we are to have a very clear scope of what is being assessed. In any audit or any assessment, the scope of what is being audited or assessed is quite important. And in terms of outcome, an audit will result in a report on compliance gaps, on areas of non-compliance. An assessment will include a report on identified risks and recommendations for closing those gaps. And you're going to find different people have different opinions of the definition of an assessment and an audit. I'm giving you the clinical definition here that is factually accurate. To give it to you most simply, perhaps think of the security assessment as studying for the exam, preparing for the exam, and the audit is the exam. And again, there's a bit of context that's important here. How punitive the audit results will be depends on the context of the audit. If it is a formal audit conducted by an external auditor as mandated by a regulatory body, there's going to be potentially some punitive measures if we're out of compliance. On the other hand, if we are conducting our own internal audit ahead of the external audit, or we have contracted a third party to audit our organization ahead of the official external audit. That can give us clarity on whether we would pass or fail the real deal, but it also gives us time to prepare to close those security gaps, those control gaps. With that out of the way, let's dig into the syllabus, beginning with attestation. Attestation is an independent verification of an organization's adherence to specific controls or standards. Attestation engagements can be internal or external, meaning performed by internal or external entities. And there's a bit of wiggle room in the phrase independent verification. There are levels. One can certainly interpret that to mean it must be an external verification because it must be independent. But the fact of the matter is, 
auditors, whether internal or external, should always be independent, meaning for an internal auditor, independent means free to report results without fear of punishment or retaliation. So that is to say, I can have independent verification of a fashion from an internal exercise, but there's going to be a higher degree of confidence to anyone else I'm presenting those results to if the attestation comes from an external source. And the syllabus calls out a few elements of internal and external audit and assessments. So we'll begin with internal. So internal audits and assessments are performed within the organization itself, usually by a dedicated team. So we have compliance audits. These audits assess an organization's internal controls against industry standards or regulatory compliance. They ensure compliance with policies and procedures. And if we are in a regulated industry, our policies and procedures should align to our regulatory obligations. Especially in larger organizations, we'll typically see an audit committee. This is a committee usually reporting to the board of directors that is responsible for overseeing the internal audit function and ensuring its independence. It doesn't work exactly the same in any two companies, but that's the typical structure. Now, self-assessments are internal evaluations conducted by an organization's own staff to identify areas for improvement in controls or processes. The organization's own staff is the key differentiator here, but not surprising given we're talking about internal functions. Now let's talk about external audit and assessment. External audits and assessments are performed by entities outside of the organization. So for example, regulatory audits. These are audits required by government agencies or other regulatory bodies to ensure compliance with specific regulations like Sarbanes-Oxley for publicly traded companies, HIPAA High Trust for healthcare organizations, PCI DSS for companies that are processing credit card transactions. And the auditors and the auditing is coming from an appointed third-party firm quite typically. So it's not always the government agency or the regulatory body itself, but someone they have appointed. Often a big consulting company that specializes in that audit function. Examinations. This is a broader term encompassing various types of external reviews, including compliance audits and security assessment. An independent third party, an external unbiased entity that conducts the auditor assessment free from conflicts of interest within the organization. Moving on to penetration testing. And we'll start with the categories of penetration test. So just a level set, penetration testing is a process that actively assesses deployed security controls trying to exploit vulnerabilities by simulating or performing an attack. A physical penetration test evaluates the physical security measures of a facility, assessing the possibility of unauthorized physical access to systems or data. Offensive testing focuses on the technical security of computer systems and networks attempting to exploit vulnerabilities to gain unauthorized access. Defensive testing focuses on evaluating the effectiveness of existing security controls to withstand attacks. And integrated testing combines physical, offensive, and defensive techniques for a more comprehensive evaluation. So to be clear, integrated is physical plus offensive plus defensive. And next we have types of penetration testing. So we have the known environment where the pen tester is given a map of the target systems and networks, and they go to test with substantial or even full information of the target systems and networks. We sometimes call this a white box test, essentially because the light has been shown on the environment on our behalf. Unknown environment, where the pen tester knows nothing about the target systems and the network, they go into the test completely blind, in the dark, so to speak, and build out the database of everything they find as they go. Because they are in the dark, we call this the black box test. Then we have the partially known environment where limited information is shared with the tester, sometimes in the form of login credentials. This simulates the level of knowledge a hacker with long-term access to a system would achieve through research and system footprinting. Sometimes called the gray box test, so we can think of that as being a partially illuminated view into the environment. 
So I call those terms out because you might see white box, black box, or gray box test appear as a potential answer on a question. So I wanted you to know the also known as options for these environments. And then just again to remind you of the all important rules of engagement. The rules of engagement in the context of a pen test define the purpose of the test and what the scope will be for the people who are performing this test on the network. They ensure everyone will be aware of what systems will be considered, date and time, and any constraints everyone should be aware of. Moving on to active and passive reconnaissance. In passive reconnaissance, we're not interacting directly with the target and as such, the target has no way of knowing recording or logging activity. This involves gathering data from publicly available sources. A few examples of passive reconnaissance. Searching the internet, so searching for information about the target organization, its employees, and its systems. Reviewing media. We can examine social media posts, news articles, and public records that might reveal details about the target's security posture. Analyzing DNS records to understand the target's network infrastructure and using search engines with advanced operators to find specific information about the target on the Google search engine. We call that Google dorking. And next is active reconnaissance, which interacts directly with the target in some way. And as such, the target may discover, record, or log these activities. So this involves using tools and techniques to probe and scan the target for vulnerabilities and potential entry points. Let's look at a few examples of active reconnaissance. So we could use port scanners to identify open ports on target networks and services running on those ports. Sending ping sweeps to identify active devices on the network. Using vulnerability scanners to identify known weaknesses in the target's systems and software. Employing social engineering techniques to trick the target's employees into revealing information about the target's security practices. It's important to remember that you should never do these without a written, signed contract from that target organization. If you don't have scope and permission in writing and signed, these are not activities you'll want to engage in because they are trackable, discoverable, and potentially punishable. And it is our ethical responsibility to always do things by the book. All right, my friends, that does it for Section 5.5. I hope you're getting value from the series. As always, if you have questions, leave them in the comments below the video or reach out directly on LinkedIn. Happy to help anywhere I can. I'll look forward to seeing you back here in the next day or so for Section 5.6, our big finish to Domain 5 and indeed the entire series. And until next time, take care and stay safe.